have I got a haul for you. I recently went to a church rummage sale and I haven't been to one of those in quite a while. I arrived 20 minutes after they opened and there was a line to get in. When I tell you I parked in the very last row of available parking spaces, I knew it was gonna be great. So I'm gonna sort this haul by decade because I have books spanning from the 1930s all the way through 2015. I did purchase one non-book item and that is what I'm gonna start with. So the first item I wanna share are these party cake pans. It's a set of pans to make a three-tiered cake, and it comes from Bake King. For your next party, bake this gay glamour cake. <laughs> I'll open these up and show them to you. I think they need a little bit of TLC. They need to be like scrubbed. Yeah, there's definitely a bug in here too. <laughs> I just noticed that. All of three pans were included. I wasn't sure what it was going to have in it. I just grabbed the box because I mean, the box itself is a real treasure. I paid $2.50. This was a major purchase. I'm gonna try to go reasonably fast, but still kind of cover everything. This first book is the Westinghouse Refrigerator book. This one is published in 1936. Beautiful, beautiful illustrations. Inside, I mean, you can open it and you definitely can tell that it has that like 1930s kind of feel. I really loved the inside cover like this with the little icebox desserts, but we're moving on to the 1940s. This first one is Enjoy Good Eating Every Day, The Easy Spry Way with Aunt Jenny. I have a few of these spry cookbooks. Aunt Jenny was like their mascot, like their Betty Crocker. This one was published in 1949 and has recipes using spry. Oh, for those that don't know, spry was a brand of shortening. So like Crisco, look at that gorgeous cake. That is a mallow nut fudge cake. Spry also had these sort of this comic theme, like the books that I have from spry have this like comic setup. And then this one is Dining Delights and this comes to us from the RT French Company. And you can see all of this packaging on the back. These were all products in their line at the time of publishing, which was 1948. I absolutely love looking at old product packaging. It can really help you date a cookbook if you don't know when it was published, if there's no published date in it. And so there's Carol French. I don't know that she was real. I mean, <laughs> a lot of these companies had Betty Crocker type figureheads that were just not real. One cool thing about this one is that the recipes are actually printed in more of a recipe card style. So I think you were supposed to cut these out. I'm very glad that the person who owned this before me did not cut them out because now I get to have this cookbook. <laughs> Using French's products, so spices, mustard. It looks like they had a pie crust mix at the time. They definitely don't have that now. I think it's very funny that they included Brasso and Silvo silver polish because those are not foods. They were in the line, but you're not going to put those in any of your dinner dishes. <laughs> not if you want to keep your guests around. <laughs> this is one that I have seen in some of my cookbook groups. I was very excited to get my hands on a copy. The American Woman's Cookbook from the Culinary Arts Institute. And it has, first off, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. And then it's, if you can see, it's got this like kind of index on the side where you can flip to different sections. So this book, actually, I was at the table of books digging through excitedly. <laughs> and there was a gentleman there who was also looking at cookbooks. He had this in his hand and I was like, oh, do you collect cookbooks? I do. And he said, oh no, I'm looking for my friend. They collect cookbooks, but they already have this one. Do you want it? And I was like, are you sure? <laughs> so. I didn't initially find this book. Someone else found this and gave it to me. Thank you, whoever you are. This book was published in 1941. I think there are other editions of this book. It does have a lot of color photographs in it. It's so heavy. <laughs> really, really nice. There's some black and white ones in here too, but this is another one of the like more comprehensive cookbooks that someone would have had in their home. You maybe would have gotten this as a gift for a newlywed or something like that. Someone who is learning to cook. Look at that cake. How gorgeous. Moving on to the 1950s. That's a familiar face right there. Good old Betty. Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker's soft Soft as silk, I don't know if I'm ever saying that right, special occasion cakes. So these cakes were cakes that you could make from scratch. So you'll see a lot of these little booklets for things like her cake mixes, her frosting mixes, Bisquick, things like that. And it'll be recipes that use those sort of like pre-made products. This is all recipes using cake flour. I have some recipe booklets from Betty Crocker that I can't even try the recipes because the products inside don't exist anymore, but you can still buy cake flour. Actually, I think the cake flour that I have is maybe this kind. Love that pink cake on the cover. 
so pretty always. There's all kinds of ideas in here for decorating cakes. And some of these things like this little drum cake here, I've seen that in many <laughs> Betty Crocker cookbooks, but these are always fun. I love these little product booklets. This one was published in 1957. So this is more of like a cookbook as a gift because it's in a box and the box is still with it, which is just incredible. So it's got the same picture on the cover, a world of good eating, recipes from around the world. So it has all kinds of recipes from all over. This book was published in 1951 and it has this very handwritten look to it, which I just love. I think that's so much fun. And then along with the handwritten recipes, it has these beautiful little color sketches. I was super excited to find this just because I think it is so pretty and it included like the box and everything. Sometimes with these books, if they include a dust cover or a box or something, you're not gonna get all the pieces. But someone collected all of these. And actually some of these books, like this one, had a name on them. And so several of the books that I got are from the same lady's collection. So thank you. It looks like her name is Eleanor. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. I will cherish your cookbooks. So then this one is Friendship Foods, contributed for friends in Finland by readers of the Cleveland Press. What a fun illustration. This is also from Eleanor. Thank you so much. I can't remember if it actually had a date on it, but there were some things in here that sort of let me know when it was published. Okay, so there's like, here's the story of how this cookbook came about. And it says in the autumn of 1957, Alcoa was hosting newspaper food editors Etc. Etc. So I like read through this, and so I know that this was published around or after 1957. And there are all these like Finnish recipes in here, so I'm kind of excited to try them. Not sure exactly how close to authentic they are, but it's interesting. And then we have this book, which is a children's cookbook called Sugar and Spice and all things nice. And it was a gift from Yale TV appliances and furniture. You can barely see it in the corner there. And this is a Westinghouse cookbook. I sorted these out and dated them and now I can't remember how I figured out the date of this one. But this book reminds me a lot of Date Bait. If you've watched me from the beginning, you know that one of my very early videos was about a cookbook called Date Bait and it was a picture cookbook has a lot of these like pictures in the ingredient list and the instructions and stuff that look a lot like the same photos. Also, like, come on, love a drawing of a cute dog and a vintage cookbook. <laughs> Inexpensive layer cake. I don't know exactly what that means if it's like a basic layer cake. I love this basic color scheme of black, white, and red. So that is what I have for the 1950s. We're not done yet. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I really, this video is gonna be so long if I'm not careful. This cookbook is the Hofbrau House Specialties Cookbook. I loved this book mostly because businesses in the Cleveland area purchased ad space and it has been so much fun to look through these businesses, see if there are some that still exist, do they exist in the same place? Unfortunately, like a lot of these are gone. This particular restaurant, in the late 1960s, this was located in Middleburg Heights. I know that it's been in at least two different locations since then, like this location has closed, it's moved to at least two other places, if not more. The way that I was able to date this, let me see if I can find it. There's like an ad in here for, for an election. Also, some of these ads are in German because this is like a German themed cookbook. Here it is, vote for the best man, Ralph E. Krieger for County Sheriff. November 5th, 1968. So that <laughs> lets me know that this book is from 1968. This is kind of a cookbook. It's more, well, it's fish facts. I mean, I couldn't resist this guy right here from Euclid Fish Company. And it's just this like helpful little book, you know, you would have picked up at Euclid Fish Company. How to clean the fish, just like a little bit of everything, but really it's that illustration on the front that got me. <laughs> that was the 1960s. Got a few from the 1970s. Gotta have another Betty. Betty Crocker's Good and Easy Cookbook. I have the like, previous version of this, like the previous edition. This copy was published in 1977. I have to say, you don't get the super fun drawings and illustrations in the later Betty Crocker books like you do in like the 50s and 60s. These are mostly photographs, which I'll take photographs too. But if you've seen some of the other books, the Hostess cookbook, A Dinner in a Dish, I mean, those have some amazing, <laughs> amazing drawings. It has my favorite kind of binding, <laughs> that double, wire ring binding. Then we have treasured Polish recipes for Americans. Now this book looks older. The original printing of this was 1948. This particular copy was published in the 70s. So it wasn't like 
positive whether or not I wanted to include it in the 40s. I included it in the 70s just because this, this exact copy was published in the 1970s. I really love the cover illustration. They also do have some what look like kind of like black print illustrations in here. Not a ton, but just like a few here and there. Rounding out the 1970s, we have Sunday Breakfast, a cookbook for men. <laughs> and this is one of those little like nitty gritty cookbooks. If you're a collector, you've probably seen a lot of these. They are almost always in this like rectangular shape. The cover is great. I just love that it is a cookbook for men. I don't know why, <laughs> why it is. It was published in 1971. I mean, come on. I can't. These are some great illustrations, totally up my alley. But it looks like there are a lot of really good recipes in here too for all kinds of breakfast dishes. Oh my gosh, look at this. Look at this chicken. There's sections on eggs, how to make different kinds of omelets, Sunday egg specialties, a whole section on just different kinds of pancakes, corn cakes, popovers. So pretty much like anything that you could want when it comes to breakfast. We are in the home stretch, folks. I've got my 1980s cookbooks right here. This one is from Real Lemon, whoops, for their 50th anniversary. Love the binding. I don't know why this is my favorite kind of binding. <laughs> this was from 1984. You can see the product packaging there. At the time, this was a Borden product. I don't know if it is now. I saw some Jello molds. Where'd you go? You can't hide from me. <laughs> I knew it. Still some Jello molds, even in 1984. It says collector's edition on it, which kind of cracks me up. Oh, and we have the order form. So if you wanted to order more copies of this for your friends and family, for holiday gift giving, you could do so. I wonder what would happen though if I tried to send one of these in now. This is a tiny, tiny one. And again, could not resist it. It is the Del Monte Foods Light Fruit, a basket full of flavor. So it was for their light line of fruit, which probably means like fruit packed in juice or light syrup. Um, but again, I just love this tiny little size. This one's from 1980. And there are lots of cute photos in here. I wasn't like super excited about the recipes, but I don't know, something about this little tiny book really got me. This one is Bumblebee, Seafarer's Favorites. Look at that cool logo. I don't know, it's so cool. It looks like it's carved out of wood. And this is from 1982. There's a whole bunch of like product packaging in here, which I love to see. This is another really cool Cleveland specific one that I picked up. Gas is a great cook cookbook. This is the East Ohio gas company. I don't know if any of these are focusing, so apologies if some of these end up a little blurry. I'm really trying to get through all of them. The reason I liked this so much, all of the recipes are contributed by local chefs. So local in the early 1980s. You can see the original chef who maybe created or contributed this recipe. And it's, it is a little sad to read through these because some of these don't exist anymore, but there are still a few that have been around since then. It's exciting to see that. And it includes like a photograph of the chef and everything. I think that's really neat. I even like these like background photos of like the different dishes. Here is my like one more modern day cookbook that I picked up. Couldn't resist this one because I, I paid a dollar for it and it's like $30. And that is The Food Lab by J. Kenji Lopez Alt. This is super heavy. That's why I have to hold it with both hands. I mean, look at that right there. Quite the volume. I love Kenji's recipes. I love his approach to food. He's a chef and he's very um, thorough. So he like researches the best possible way to like make certain dishes and things like that. But he somehow also makes food very approachable and cooking very approachable. He's not gonna look down on people who maybe can't get the fanciest and best ingredients. It's kind of like work with what you have, like work with what you can get. And I respect that so much because I think there are sometimes people who want to get into cooking, but it can be a little bit discouraging if it's not something that they grew up doing or the people around them didn't grow up doing and they like see all of these very complicated recipes and expensive fancy ingredients and it kind of like turns them away. That's not him. He has all kinds of different types of food that he makes. If you get a chance, you should definitely, you know, check out his Instagram account, check out his YouTube videos, especially the ones he made during like 2020, 2021. That was, that was a really interesting time for all of us, of course, but that was kind of fun to watch because the, he couldn't always get ingredients that he would normally be able to get as you know, we weren't maybe grocery shopping quite as much. Availability wasn't always there. So he came up with some interesting like solutions and stuff like that but there are tons of great recipes in this book that I really look forward to cooking. And I can't believe I got this for a dollar. <laughs> this entire stack of cookbooks that you see here, I paid 
$10.50. And I wanted to include uh, in this video just a couple of pieces of advice on rummage sales in, in general. And you know, you can apply these to other places where you would purchase your cookbooks or your books. So first off, rummage sales, if you're gonna go take cash, preferably take an assortment of like smaller bills. You just never know what they're gonna have available. This particular rummage sale that I went to, you could use a credit card, but honestly, like that is rare. I haven't seen that at a lot of rummage sales that I've been to. This makes things, paying for things a lot easier. Sometimes you find stuff and if you don't have cash with you, like you're gonna have to maybe see if they'll hold it and then, you know, leave and come back. The other piece of advice I would say is take your own bags. Sometimes the sales, like they don't have bags or the bags that they do have are very like flimsy kind of plastic grocery bags. I took my own and thank goodness because this stack of books was very heavy. And my last piece of advice, if you're going to a church rummage sale, pay attention to the demographic, I guess you could say, of that particular church or denomination. This rummage sale, was a Catholic church. And I kind of know that in my area, the congregations of those churches, like sometimes the average age skews a little bit older and no shade because like I'm getting older too. But if you really sit and think about it, if it's a congregation of like young families, if you go to the rummage sale, the donations are gonna be probably be like a lot of children's clothing, toys, that kind of thing. And if that's what you're looking for, like great, like you can use this piece of advice in any direction that you want. For me, you know, I'm more interested in vintage items. So in the group like skews a little bit older and they're trying to downsize, like there is a chance that they're gonna get rid of something like these cake pans or like these cookbooks, the things that I want, the things that I'm looking for. And you can also like take this piece of advice and apply it to neighborhoods if you're garage sailing. If it's a neighborhood that has a lot of like people who are retired, you know, again, maybe they're trying to downsize and they're trying to like sell off some of the stuff they're not using anymore, there may be a chance that it's, it's a vintage item or something that you're looking for. But just kind of give us some thought to the people who are making the donations to the sale or whatever that you are attending. And it can kind of help you determine if, if you're gonna maybe get some real fines or not. I hope you like this video. I hope you enjoyed this haul and maybe a little bit of the advice that I gave can help you add to your collection. If you did like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I love making videos about food, vintage cookbooks, and retro recipes every week. So if you know someone who loves those things, please share this video with them. It really does help my channel grow by reaching a larger audience. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.